Welcome to Picked Voices, the interview series conducted by the faculty of the Paris Institute for Critical Thinking with notable members of the broader Pick community. Our goal is to present our community with a variety of voices across the spectrum of the humanities and critical creative thinking. My name is Christoph van Houten, and today it's my great pleasure and honor to be joined by Sophia Rosenfeld, Walter H. Annenberg Professor of History at the University of Pennsylvania. Hello, Sophia, and welcome. Thank you. Hello to you, and it's lovely to be speaking with you. Well, thank you for joining us. And I have to say that I'm particularly pleased to talk to you because not only do you have something to say about truth, but also you have something to say about common sense, two topics about which you have written particularly interesting books. And for almost half a decade now, we have been bombarded about truth. We have been confronted also with alternative truths and with blatant lying. And who hasn't been confronted with the call for necessity to return to our common sense? Who needs specialists or experts anyway? This all started in the realms of politics with the various Trumps, Johnsons, and the other lesser known populists around the globe, like Salvini, Orban, Wilders, Bolsonaro, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And it then continued in an even more polarizing way during the unfortunately still ongoing pandemic, and which brought us a whole new series of populist and truth bearers or specialists in real truth, known by none except themselves. Now, in the light of all of this, Talking to you, Sophia, can only but be interesting and offer a bit of fresh air. So thank you again for being with us. Now, the first question, one that I think is essential to beginning with, regards the meaning of both concepts, truth and common sense. When talking about truth in the political world, or even now the truth in the medical world, we are not talking about all forms of truth. And you make this perfectly clear in your book on truth and democracy. And when we specifically turn to common sense also, we see that it is a highly equivocal concept. And our current common understanding of it, if this even makes any sense, is only very limited and very historically conditioned. Now, can you tell us a bit more about these two concepts and their various meanings, please? Yes, certainly. And you've put your finger on the problem that in fact, it's very hard to talk about truth. Sometimes truth means the opposite of errors or various kinds of misinformation, which makes it a problem of knowledge, and is the opposite of lies or disinformation, which makes it a moral problem. And that's just the beginning. After that, there's the problem that truth comes in many different forms. There's moral truths. There are factual truths. You know, yesterday it was 10 degrees. Today it's 20 degrees. That's a factual truth. There are logical truths. Two plus two equals four that don't rest on experience the way other kinds of truths do. And so that's the beginning of the problem. When we talk about truth, it's sometimes very unclear what, we're, what we mean and when. As for common sense, usually that means something more like a set of socially agreed upon truths that we all sort of agree upon without much discussion. Sometimes that comes from basic logic, but most of the time that comes from lived experience. Hot things burn you if you touch them. You know that because once you touch something hot and everybody else has had the same experience, so we all basically agree and don't have to discuss that hot things can burn you. The question that makes common sense complicated is that sometimes those truths vary across cultures and across time. At certain times and places, people would have said, for instance, that God is great is common sense, but maybe now that's a debated idea. And even more, there's the question, what is common sense useful for? Sometimes common sense is really essential to democratic life, but in other, words, in other cases, it can be a threat to it. So neither common sense nor truth is something really, really that self-evident. They always are being redefined in different ways. And that of course makes them political. So maybe I'll stop there with that opening uh, complication. Yeah, and, and, and we can take it further from there. But before enter, venturing into your work uh, a bit more deeply, first one more uh, combined question on truth and common sense. Now, you are a historian. So your investigation of these concepts is historical. 
And I think this approach is very relevant in the light of the exaggerated claims of novelty and unprecedentedness as they have been recently made in the context of COVID, for example, but not just in this context. Also in political history, there's always this novelty that uh, lingers around the corner. So why do you think it is important as a historian to look a bit further than the length of one's nose, especially regarding these omnipresent but also highly polemical and uh, arguably discussable concept? Well, there's been, of course, as you say, much conversation in recent years in many countries about this phenomenon often called post-truth. Mm -hmm. And the suggestion is often that something has changed very recently. And that leads to the possibility that something has happened very recently to change our relationship to truth. Most often people point to social media, which I agree is extremely important in this story. COVID is of course an ex an, uh, an a factor that's had an important uh, effect on all of our conversations about truth in just the last two years. But in all of this conversation, the assumption has been that whatever has happened has very shallow causes. It can only have be something that has existed you know, maybe in the last 10 years and certainly only in the years since, as you mentioned, Trump and Johnson and Bolsonaro and others came to power. What hasn't been much discussed in all of this is the possibility that truth already has a complex and not terribly stable relationship to democracy and that it goes back much, much deeper than simply the phenomenon of Facebook or Twitter. And I think that's true and since you mentioned it too, of the discussion of common sense as well. Both have been important factors in making democracy possible, but also in threatening democracy for the last 200 plus years. And historians have the advantage, I think, of being able to show both long-term causes and short-term developments. And most interestingly, where they intersect and so my goal has really been not to dismiss at all the importance of the changes that have taken place in the last few years. History doesn't repeat itself. These are new phenomena, but they intersect with long-standing patterns. And I think we see that it's just simply too simple to imagine there was a reign of solid truth. And then one day we gave up on it and now we're post-truth as if there were a kind of moment of break and everything had been absolutely stable before that. So I don't think we're in a moment that you would describe as unprecedented, though I do think we're in a new moment. It's simply one that a larger, longer perspective, I think, allows us to see better. Mm. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. And in fact, continuing on this and, and turning now more specifically to your worth on, uh, work on truth, uh, I would like to draw you out here a little further on truth and the media. Now, some time ago, I had a conversation with a journalist here on Picked on Voices as well, and he maintained, just like you do, that the problem is not that the media lie. There is nothing new under the sun here. They have always done so. But whereas he stopped there, you added an interesting point to this uh, conversation. And in fact, you say that the problem or the novelty is not so much with the media, but with ourselves. It is we, us, modern people, who have come to believe that one can, in fact, report something objectively in the realm of the media, and also, if I can add, in the realm of politics uh, as well. How did we come to have this idea or belief? And is this belief itself what is problematic? That's a really interesting framing of the question, I think, because most of us would say, regardless of politics, objectivity is our goal. We want to know things definitively and surely and with no kind of bias entering our conversation. But interestingly, what historians have found is that objectivity itself is a fairly new goal in politics and in media. And both are related to the growth, largely in the 19th century, of new ideas of science and new ideas of expertise. And I think an idea that really has its origins in science, a kind of can you know things in some kind of purely a neutral way without letting any of your human biases enter, made its way slowly into media. Now, of course, that wasn't the only kind of media that emerged in the 19th century. There's also um, so-called yellow journalism, all kinds of sensationalism enters part of the press, but the sort of prestige press 
prided itself on conveying ostensibly objective approaches to what was happening in the world. And if you want to sort of spin this out, you can say in the 20th century, that becomes um, a kind of technocratic view of the world where, for instance, statistics operate as facts and we can govern based on an almost impersonal um, set of expert responses to the world, often quantifiable. And so I would say that in a certain sense, there's been pushback against this and people are right, ordinary people, mm -hmm. all of us, to sometimes be skeptical of this kind of um, promise that science alone can reveal our world and a science that's set and indisputable. Part of being existing in a democracy, part of being a citizen, I think, is to always be asking certain kinds of questions. So to give you an example, we might agree that the information that our government has given us about unemployment rates right now is accurate in a certain sense, but is it fully objective? Well, we have to maybe ask, for instance, doesn't the unemployment statistic depend on how we define employment in the first place? Could we ask questions about what counts as employment, about how to think about people who don't seek employment at all? Are they included in this statistic? We could, we could reasonably ask a variety of questions that might lead us to think that even a metric as ostensibly clear as an unemployment rate is full of different assumptions about how we live and who matters and what work is. On the other hand, there's also another danger, I think, that is prevalent right now, which is a total kind of skepticism that leads you only to a kind of conspiracy thinking where nothing is as it seems and everything is nefarious and everything is a plot. And of course, this is one of the dangers of our times, which is a kind of sense that anything that's touted as official information can only be the workings of bias. And that of course is not healthy for a democracy. So we're, the ideal is something I suppose that's very hard to put exact parameters around. And the striving for objectivity is of course a wonderful goal, but I think there's important to recognize the ways in which achieving objectivity, achieving a kind of fixity in knowledge is always gonna be an elusive goal and mm. that's okay. Yeah, if, if I can add one thing here, do you think maybe that the problem is here with um, the magical those who are telling the story or with us uh, who are reading the story? Well, both, because I think it's important that information be presented as always in some sense, the best guess we have at this moment, mm. that it be clear that experts make clear, let's say in the case of COVID, that they are offering us at all times state-of-the-art information. This is not meant to be politicized, um, uh, you know, sort of efforts to deceive. On the other hand, knowledge is only as good as its moment. This, is, this will not be the definitive word. And I think that isn't always clear. Experts sometimes present information as really definitive and unquestionable, but also on the part of ordinary people, lack of trust that's been growing in our society, in particularly in terms of the media and in terms of expertise, leads us also to greatly exaggerate that precarity and insist therefore that, for instance, you know, if the World Health Organization tells us something about COVID, that it's not a best guess given the circumstances, given the evidence, but is in fact an attempt to do something else that's entirely different from the uh, stated intentions of spokespeople for the organization. So I think that there's a, the problem of trust runs in two directions and that's why it's going to be hard to solve this anytime soon. Yeah, I, I, I fear I agree with you here. Um, <laughs> one more aspect of your research on truth has uh, pleasantly confirmed uh, my own impressions and, and this continues a bit on what we have just been talking about as well. And um, anyway, you observe on numerous occasions that uh, uh, partisan jargon notwithstanding, even the most widely opposed groups on the political spectrum actually mimic each other in their take on truth. 
For example, you make the intriguing statement that populists and technocrats actually fight the same battles, which is something that I have uh, noticed in the battles between recently between the vaxxers and the anti-vaxxers. Although they will deny this very loudly, but they actually pretty much say the exact same thing. What more can you say about this and how come do you think, first of all, this happens so often and how come this is also so often missed? It's interesting to think about that question in terms of anti-vaxxers, which has been one of the great and maybe um, unanticipated phenomena of the last few years. And your question is really related to the last one, which is to say, in a democracy, I think, in an ideal situation, and now I really am talking about an ideal situation, there's some kind of back and forth between popular truth and expert truth. So say the population hears the experts and takes seriously what they have to say. This would be hearing information. Most doctors, most health experts, most epidemiologists around the world are in agreement, for instance, that vaccines are beneficial. Maybe they don't work 100% of the time in some perfect way, but they are, in general, an advantage to our collective health. So the population takes this information but the experts also revise their information over time based on the experience of the population. Mm. People report back unexpected circumstances. They respond in different ways. They maybe there's hesitancy about vaccinating children as opposed to adults. There's in other words, ideally a kind of dialogue in which there's no dismissing the significance of either experiential knowledge nor expertise in the form of medical knowledge or in any, we could come up with other examples as well. I'll just use your Vaxxer example. Mm -hmm. But what we've seen lately seems to suggest a kind of danger that democracies always run into, which is that one side of that equation in, attempt, in a sense attempts to capture knowledge in full and sees the other side is simply wrong-headed and lying. Um, that would mean, for instance, a kind of, I used the example before of technocracy. That's a kind of state of existence in which experts have, in a sense, captured the whole sphere of knowledge and need to hear very little from citizens about their own experience in order to impose ideas. More dangerously in our moment, we might have said it maybe, you know, maybe 30 years ago, we might have said our greatest danger is technocracy. I think today we'd say the opposite. The idea of populist movements, which is, in a sense, to capture or hijack truth and dismiss as illegitimate expert knowledge, even when that expert knowledge could save lives, as in information about vaccination. And so, though I see certain parallels between the vax and anti-vax movements, I think that at this moment, it's the anti-vaxxers who are, in a sense, um, most responsible for trying to dismiss the other side of the knowledge equation as simply um, out for political gain. Mm -hmm. And the end result has sadly been, um, there would have been an extraordinary number of deaths from COVID in any case, but clearly the movement against vaccinations has increased that number. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a, a pretty clear example of how knowledge battles can result in effects that go well beyond just squabbling over what is truth. Okay. Uh, what, what, what I actually was, I, it wasn't just that they were doing the same thing that I was aiming for, but that also they were doing the same thing with the same means. I, I, I always, when, when yes. I read your work, I always thought that that was uh, also one of the implications of it. And, and the example of the vaxxers and the anti-vaxxers is exactly that, that they both go for the same thing. They exactly say the, they say the exact same opposite, but it's always at the same thing that they go. They go for numbers, they go for their experts. So it's not that one goes for the expert and the other doesn't go. They all go for their own experts. They all go for their own numbers. They all say the exact same thing, but for opposite reasons of this. Yes, I think that's I think that's right. And I think that's one of the things people haven't noticed as much in this in this discussion of post-truth, that there really is a kind of parallelism mm. that um, that it's very easy to see 
the, both the side of expertise and the side of populism is getting entrenched and using some of the same methods and offering some of the same sort of threats to mm. the stability of democracy, which really does depend on, it doesn't mean that populists and experts have to agree in full. That's never mm. the goal. Democracies don't work on agreement in full, but they do work on a certain kind of low level agreement, some basic shared understandings and some willingness to listen to each other, mm. some idea of a kind of back and forth. And mm. if we are so polarized that we can't imagine anything could be learned from this other sector, that makes democracy very hard to practice, I think. Mm. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And, and, and I, 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 unfortunately, at least here in, in Europe, one sees ever more this polarization grow and grow and grow. And, and the vaccine and, and anti-vaccine is only one uh, one uh, apparition of this uh, polarization that grows. Yes, it's only, I only bring it up because it's so evident right now. Yes. In the United States right now, for instance, a similar conversation about whether it's possible to find the vote tallies legitimate or not is having a similarly kind of polarizing mm. effect. The, the so-called big lie mm. uh, about whether or not uh, the last presidential election was won by Trump or not. There's mm. no evidence that it was won by Trump, but this has caused a similar kind of rift. But around the world, we can find other examples. The, this all took place. COVID happened in a world in which this kind of approach to truth was already happening. The mm. VAX movement just fell into it. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, again, there's very little new under the sun, and that's why yeah. history is so <laughs> is so interesting. Because, like you said, it's not that it repeats itself, but sometimes it's like, yeah, you could have changed a little bit more than we we already went yeah. through something similar. Anyway, turning now to your work on common sense, um, which is obviously uh, very related to the issue of truth. Now, although you have identified very different definitions of common sense in the past three hundred years. And I have to say that I particularly appreciated your Foucaultian approach here. And there seems to be, notwithstanding the differences, a uh, very uh, concrete constant throughout the centuries, uh, centuries, namely that common sense is almost always crisis related. Can you tell us a bit more about this? And does this also imply that the evocation of common sense is uh, by necessity a reactionary move? That's a very interesting question, whether to think about this as a reactionary movement. Let me start by saying that we don't think very much about truth on any of its forms, including common sense, until they seem to be in crisis. You know, it seems like something that's just there. We're only talking about post-truth because we think something happened. Truth is otherwise, like common sense, supposed to be just the backdrop to our lives. And when we see it, we're not even sure what we're quite looking for. You know, it's very hard to put your finger on what the subject matter is here. But common sense is particularly supposed to be the realm of things that don't require much discussion because they're so self-evident. If something were common sense, you barely need to state it, much less discuss it. Except that, and I think this is where your question about whether common sense is a reactionary is interesting, Common sense only really does get evoked when it's to do something with it. And what that something is, is sometimes to take down a reigning assumption. So for instance, during the enlightenment, if you wanted to challenge certain ideas, particularly religious ideas, you could say, but common sense shows us that there are, you know, that angels are not hovering in our midst or something like that. You could sort of attack an established idea but the other thing common sense can do is exactly what you're describing, which is to serve as a kind of reactionary bulwark against change. So you can shore up existing ideas by invoking common sense. So for instance, if somebody says the planet is warming and global warming is a real phenomenon because say experts have shown that temperatures have increased by three degrees Celsius in, in, over some period of time, a common sense approach could be like, that's nonsense. Look at my backyard. It's full of snow. What do you mean <laughs> the world is getting warmer? I have more snow this today, in December 19th, than I did last year. Mm. And common sense tells you that snow is, happens when it's cold. Mm. You know, so you can use the um, assumptions of common sense sometimes to resist new ideas. 
But what I think is important here is that common sense has no politics really built into it. It's mm. just simply always responsive. Mm. It, it, it can, and it's a useful tool. So what interested me about common sense is that it's often invoked as if it were the most neutral thing in the world. Mm. So you, you know, politicians love to have things like common sense gun laws or in the US or common sense uh, climate policy, which suggests here's the thing that we all agree on because it's completely self-evident and any sensible person would think this was the case, except that almost always when somebody invokes common sense, it's polemical in some way. It's to mm. do something. It's either to change the status quo or to shore up the status quo. So I thought it was interesting to look at why democracies are so attached to this idea. And in particular, we've found that common sense politics have gravitated towards the right in recent years. Um, that hasn't always been the case. Mm. The most famous document about common sense is uh, Tom Paine's common sense that basically starts the American revolution in the 18th century. But today common sense has increasingly come to have a kind of right-wing valence. Um, and it'll be interesting to see if that remains the case yeah. You know, as the 21st century it continues. <laughs> this also takes me to my next question, and, and that is obviously that we need to confront this elephant that you just mentioned, namely uh, common sense and its relationship with populism. Uh, for quite a while now, populism has been on the forefront of democratic politics, or at least what passed for democratic politics, what passes for democratic politics today. But the link between common sense and populism does not seem to be a historical constant, unlike that between common sense and crisis. So, and this takes us to what you just said. So what are, what is the apparent linkage here? Is, is it just temporal? Is it just today that this is happening? Or is, is there a, a, a return that is coming or that we that you can see in your historical uh, research? Or is there more at hand to you? So I think that Common sense from the 18th century onwards has always propelled popular movements because it's a kind of knowledge associated with ordinary people and their lived experience. And sometimes that's been for very progressive causes because common sense can be something almost anyone can evoke, invoke in their defense. But populism in particular this idea that the real people aren't given their chance to rule has been a kind of um, backlash against established forms of democracy since the late 19th century. And populism in particular has depended upon the idea of common sense in a particular way. And usually it goes like this. It sounds like a kind of myth almost. Mm. Um, once the ordinary people's real way of seeing the world had power and shaped the way things were. But somehow in the intervening time, that power has been captured by the wrong people, usually by some kind of elites. Sometimes that's financial elites. Sometimes that's intellectual elites or cosmopolitans. Sometimes it's those people in cahoots with people at the margins. So immigrants or a, or a racial or a religious minority. And the argument goes that those, those groups have collectively kind of hijacked truth and taken it out of the orbit of ordinary people. But when ordinary people can push those people aside and reassert their view of how the world really is, we can get back to the way things are supposed to be and in fact, we might even get past politics. We might just get to the sort of reign of common sense. And that myth has been reanimated, I think in many places in the world very recently as a kind of backlash and against, um, against globalization, against cosmopolitanism, against uh, movements of peoples around the world, against economic inequality. And it, has validity insofar as it often has the right targets, but it can turn into a kind of xenophobia and anti-immigrant sentiment. And it can also threaten more largely the kind of pluralist foundations of democracy, which rest on the idea that there are lots of different ways to get to truth. There are lots of different people with different sets of ideas and they can threaten our uh, convictions about the importance of looking to experts for in certain areas. We want 
you know, planes flown by people who know how to fly planes. We want buildings built by people who know engineering. Mm. We want medicine done by people who know something about um, health in the body. And these are these are areas in which uh, we don't want to turn our back, I don't think, on yeah. expertise. Mm. Politics is complicated in that regard because politics, of course, is the one realm in which we require some kind of meeting point between mm. expert knowledge and everyday people's view of the world, which we're supposed to see every time there's an election. And populism, I think one of the real risks of populism is that it, at the same time as it's popular, it doesn't really take the pluralism of democracy to be an important factor. It only takes as an important factor, the rule of the population in some kind of totalizing way. Yeah, and, and, and like the myth that you just said just made me smile because it's Genesis mm -hmm. all over. And, and then people talk about secularization when it's just a religion coming back once again. But now it's in a hidden way. It's interesting how politics often has kinds of mythologies attached to it. And I, mm -hmm. I do think that one thing historians can sometimes reveal is the kind of um, deep-seated mythologies that we often accept without thinking about very much because they're so ordinary. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and, and also that people might think that they're gone. Oh, we have grown mm -hmm. up, we, 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 we don't follow this kind of thinking anymore. Whereas then it comes back and it just bites you when you're behind. <laughs> yes. Yes. To conclude, I think we can agree that the societal situation in our current Western world is highly polarized, a fact that is exacerbated by the obnoxious lemma of post-truth and the populist call for a return to a mainly reactionary common sense. And unfortunately, we seem to have been imperialistic in this aspect as well, exporting these woes to the rest of the world. The temptations of resentment and desolation are very strong all over the place now. What remedies does the historian's view have to offer here? Ah, every historian's favorite question, in a sense, right? What is history <laughs> why, why do to tell we do us it? except about the past? Yeah. <laughs> why do so we do what, what we do? Does it have any purpose whatsoever? There, there's always that risk. Well, uh, what historians can't do, let me start by saying, is offer really good prophecies. You know, I don't know what's going to happen. And, um, you know, the, and I don't have secret um, resources about how best to resolve these problems. But I do think historians have a role to play in any conversation about policy and the future. And that is a one in which, in a sense, historians allow us to travel. They allow us to see outside our immediate circumstances. If you go on a trip and you come back Sometimes your own world, even your own backyard looks different to you. And I feel that historians offer something similar, which is a chance to see the world from up high and with great distance and often across different cultures. And what's the advantage of this kind of seeing? Well, I think it allows us to update our own thinking to match circumstances. So to give you an example, if I were solely focused on policy, I might be looking at very small solutions, some of which may be useful, but stay within the paradigm that we're used to. So for instance, I might say, how do we strengthen fact-checking at newspapers? Mm -hmm. Fact-checking is very important, but probably fact-checking will do little to alter the larger dynamic that I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. But if you really want to reorient the conversation not necessarily in a totally practical way, but to simply offer up the possibility that there are new ways of seeing and that there are new possible paradigms out there. You have to get past the kind of immediate policy debates of our moment. And I like to think at least, maybe this is just a way to think historians matter, <laughs> is that historians help us see where our ideas aren't keeping up with circumstances. For instance, are we still invested in an enlightenment model of truth? Does it work for our world today? That's a question and a debate I think worth having. And they help us um, think about the larger kind of sometimes buried 
assumptions and premises that we bring to our conversations and ask when they're absolutely essential and when they're not. So when you say, for instance, this myth is still with us and it has a kind of, it looks a little like Genesis. So that's an interesting point. Historians can help you, I think, see where those exist and then actually help you rethink the premises on which we build our cases today. Journalists are extraordinarily helpful in helping us see the world that's right around us and uncovering all sorts of aspects of our current world. But historians put that set of findings into larger pictures in which we can see patterns, repetitions, departures, and the development of mythologies that uh, we're otherwise somewhat blind to, I think. So that's my sort of impassioned speech for why history matters, even though we don't have any solutions in the pocket. No, but maybe solutions are not always what is most important. Anyway, thank you for this. There are so, so many things that I would still like to pick your brain about, but uh, we have to keep it with this. For people who are interested, for example, in postmodernism and post-truth or in the uh, epistemic Democrats and the scientific irony that this brings along. If you are interested in this, then please go to see and read Sophia's book. I highly recommend them. Anyway, once again, thank you much, so much, Sophia, uh, for this highly enlightening conversation. And thanks also to our listeners for having joined us once again here at Picked Voices. And you, dear listeners, if you like our volunteering work here at Picked, you can now also consider supporting us by becoming an active member of our institution. For more information about how to join Picked, please visit our website. My name is Christoph van Houten. Thank you again. And goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.